Can Jesus actually be considered a genius? Intellectually speaking, does he belong in the same category as thinkers such as Einstein, Aristotle, and Mozart? Our guest today, Dr. Peter Williams, believes the answer to that question is yes. There is emotional intelligence plus intellectual intelligence. He's demonstrably clever with the fact that he is God. We're going to walk through his case in his recent book, The Surprising Genius of Jesus, which I thoroughly enjoyed, Peter, but you, the audience, get to evaluate if he made his case or not. We're going to jump in, but first off, thanks for being on the show. It's been long overdue having you here. Great to be with you. So let's just jump right in, and you tell me, why do you think the term genius is rarely applied to Jesus? Why is it such a surprise? to try to convince people that Jesus is a genius? Well, I think people are often prepared to think of Paul as an intellectual genius mm. because of his writings. Because Jesus doesn't leave writings directly, uh, then I think people can think there isn't something there that we can study. But of course, you've got so many of his words. Now, sometimes people say, are oh, those words come from the gospel writers, not really from him, or they come from the early Christians. And people see all the things that come from Jesus as actually not from him, but coming from later people. Mm -hmm. And I think we can make a real, really good case. It, it go back to Jesus and it is intellectually brilliant. I think you're right. I think there's also the sense that Jesus kind of told these stories and bumbled around and talked with kids. But even the teachings themselves, I think, even though we have them with us, people don't understand and appreciate, and many times, myself included, the kind of hidden Jesus within it. And that's exactly what we're going to unpack. Now, in some ways, this is an obvious question, but I want to make sure we're on the same page. Tell us what you mean by the word Jesus. And I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Tell us what you mean by the word genius and yeah. why you think Jesus qualifies as a genius. Well, I think uh, Jesus combines really real um, factual knowledge of a great kind, lots of detail with an amazing insight and ability to simplify. He's able to teach uh, different levels simultaneously. Um, there's emotional intelligence plus intellectual intelligence uh, packed together. Um, lots of analysis, lots of scriptural knowledge there and his uh, analysis of the human condition all piled together. So I, th I think together it's it's an amazing uh, array of uh, intellectual capability that we have there. Okay, so when I'm asked to fill out applications for like students that are trying to go, recommendations going to college, it'll be like top 25%, top 5, top 10, and then top 1% is like exceptional. Are you saying Jesus is in that top 1% or arguably even higher one of the greatest thinkers of all time, the divinity issue aside. I just want to make sure I understand. Yeah, would you yeah, put so him in that I, category? I, I would say he, he breaks the instrument of measurement. <laughs> so mm. whatever it is you're trying to um, calibrate him against. Uh, uh, and I really do think that that can be demonstrated. And of course, it is connected with the fact that he is god uh I, as a christian i, I believe that and i sure. think I, I commend that as a very intellectually defensible position um to others but i think sometimes people think that people simply assume he's smart because he's god so god in a sense mm. um puts the smartness into jesus says that there's so something absolutely right about that um but i'm wanting to say he's demonstrably clever so that is, we can look at the things that he said and we can measure cleverness in it, just as we could see cleverness in anyone's equations or discoveries. So what's great about this is there's kind of a top-down approach. If Jesus did the miracles, if he claimed to be God and the scriptures are reliable, like genius kind of comes with that by default. Or mm -hmm. we can go bottom up like you do in this book and say, let's just yeah. look more closely at his teachings and you even argue, we don't have to assume he's God. We don't even have to assume the Bible is entirely or the Gospels even generally reliable to get there. And we're going to unpack this. That's what I do think is genius about the argument that you're making here 
it's very fresh. Now, we're going to walk through the particulars because it's not it's not a super complex argument that I think you no. make, but it's a step-by-step -step one that you have to follow the links tied together. But before we dive in, maybe give us like a 30,000 foot view, uh, a mm -hmm. sense of where you're going so we understand the scope of what you're arguing for. Yeah, so it's a it's a brief book that I've written about 35,000 words. Maybe you can read it un in under four hours. And half mm. of it is about Jesus's shortest, uh, sorry, longest story, which is the parable of the two sons, which takes about three minutes uh, mm. to say it's under 400 words. My argument is that when you look at that and the layers of meaning there are in that, the skill of word choice at every point, that there is no story which has ever been told like it. Like no one can mm. find me another author and there are some really amazing authors out there in the world who can do quite so much in quite such a short story and, and we already know of course that Jesus's stories have been um, found to be powerful and repeated around the world and people form charities like the Samaritans because of his story of the Good sure. Samaritan but there's, there's already a sense that he's got powerful stories um, and what we try and do is go into depth on this uh, story and just show how many layers there are, how every single word counts um, emotionally. There's there's emotional power in it. There's mm. um, an intellectual and analytical power uh, there, both in terms of understanding and presenting, representing the Old Testament scriptures and understanding his audiences. So to give folks some context, I just finished yesterday an update to More Than a Carpenter, my dad's classic book, and that is 34,000 words. Your book mm -hmm. is 35,000 words. So it's a mm -hmm. smaller book. You can read quickly, but it packs a punch. You don't waste any time. Jump right into your argument. Now, what mm -hmm. struck me is that at the heart of your book is a focus on the story in Luke chapter 15, which is known as the story of the prodigal son, but it's really about the father with two sons. Now, the camera can't mm -hmm. see it, but I'm looking right now at Rembrandt's painting in my office of the prodigal oh. son. Peter, this is one of my all-time favorite stories in the book. And I love the book by Henry Nouwen on The Prodigal Son. Uh, love the book that you have written here. And you even make some insights that I stopped and told my wife. I was like, wait a minute. How did I not think about this? So I love it. But tell us why you focused on that story of all the stories of Jesus. Well, it is the longest story. And I think it's the one that um, most has these layers in demonstrably okay uh, and i've also been using it as an interactive bible study for many years so often when i would go and teach a small class of 10 20 30 people i find it works really well you read the story out and you take people through it so man has two sons younger one comes to him and says give me my share of inheritance first question is what does he do people then come immediately back with the wrong answer which is he gives it to him. And I say, no, the passage says he gives it to them. Of course, I, I can take longer to spin that out. Um, sure. The point is he, he actually shares the inheritance between the two brothers. And we go forward from there. Um, it, it works really well, Socratically asking questions. So that got me into studying it. And as I looked into it more, I began to see more layers. Obviously, some of these things have been seen before. Tim McKellar uh, has seen the... Um, a similarity with Cain and Abel and uh, lots have been said by uh, Kenneth Bailey on mm. his connection with Esau and Jacob that's all great but I think it was gradually over time realizing that it's hit on all of Genesis's um, mm. uh, major stories uh, and that it only works if it's told to the audience specifically that Luke says it was told to so okay. it's not just that the story has been well transmitted, but there are specifically four groups of people that Luke says it was told to tax collectors and sinners. You don't expect to know the Bible and scribes and Pharisees and scribes who copy the Bible uh, th 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 on the other hand. And I've been studying manuscripts for quite a while now. So quite interested in scribes and you start thinking about a way a scribe thinks. And mm -hmm. then you start reading this through scribes eyes. And it's it's phenomenal, really. You know, this is one of the stories that I wish was in John as well or in the other synoptics. We only have it in Luke, but we don't need another telling of this story. 
to capture its brilliance. Mm -hmm. The first chapter in your book is just taking the story kind of uh, uh, on its face, so to speak, mm -hmm. and saying there's layers of brilliance here that I think people are missing. Now, I'm not going to ask you to walk through all of it. We could probably spend hours just analyzing this story. And it's the kind of story, even for me, when I read Keller's book, when I read Nowen's book, every time I read it, something new pops out to me. And I think, wow, this is a brilliant story. Maybe just give us an insight of two or three of the points that jump out to help our viewers appreciate why there's such a depth of brilliance within the story itself. Yeah, so I think I'd mention a few omissions. Um, so each time the younger son, who's prodigal son, uh, talks to his father or thinks of talking to his father in his head uh all three times he calls his father father and he uses the word father mm. even more than three when the older son who seems to be behaving well at first uh speaks to his father that's the missing word he just says look all these years i've been slaving for you so there's a brilliance in the ability to omit a word which actually contrasts the younger son who is physically far far away or or for most of the story uh, and yet seems to be emotionally closer to his father than the older son, who is physically close and yet emotionally far away. Another case would be the missing ending. So we, it's hmm. the, the chapter starts with a um, story of uh, someone losing a sheep. One of a hundred sheep goes gets lost by going away from home. Then we got a story of a woman losing a coin that's lost at home. Hmm. Then we have a story, and there's rejoicing when they're found. Then we got the story of a younger son lost away from home comes back and is rejoicing then we've got the story of the older son at home not explicitly said to be lost but using sudoku principles you can work out yes he is lost because he's like the coin at home and what would happen uh, if he actually were to come into the party there would be great celebration but the story ends with this missing ending which is not telling you how the older son responds which is a very powerful thing because it makes it an invitation uh, it's a, that, that ability to have a cliffhanger, if you like, um, that's, that's very good. Or another aspect of the story is normally when people retell the story, the bit that they dwell on is what the younger son actually did. That is told in one word by Jesus, living and then this word riotously or prodigally, however you want to translate it because sin isn't interesting uh, and so jesus doesn't make a big thing about that and he actually leaves it to our imaginations which mm. is really powerful because that means that we can all relate to it whichever way that's uh, right that's it right works it doesn't glorify uh, mm. sin that's a really good way of doing things so that's just mm. negatively then you can look positively and you can say well there's word choice where you see something like when the younger son doesn't get a job it says he okay. attached himself to a citizen of that far country. And you think, wow, um, that's a powerful word. It really rubs in that he's not a citizen, he's a foreigner. Or you see uh, where it will say that they began to celebrate or he began to be in need. It gives you a sense of this going on for a long time. So I think there are just many touches which are very clever emotionally. Even the fact that if you're talking to Pharisees who are really um big into law observance and they're not going to like the fact that he's dishonored his father by asking for the inheritance up front um they're going to be really glad as the story gets to that point where he's feeding the pigs so they're absolutely emotionally on side before the story turns around and starts hitting them and again that's that's a uh, very high um eq I think it's maybe hard for Westerners sometimes to appreciate the brilliance of a story because we think in brilliance in terms of math and in terms of science. And yet the brilliance to tell a good story at the right pacing, with the right depth, what to include, what to not include, uh, what, how to emotionally capture somebody, tell a story that people remember. This is hands down not only one of the greatest stories that Jesus told, but arguably one of the greatest stories that has been told. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing even today how many people, when we see a movie, we go, oh, it's the story of the prodigal son. I mean, this has really yep. framed Western and Eastern culture. And yet your point is saying is if we just go back to these verses, which I think you said is 388 words, if I'm not mistaken, less than 400 words. 
there's a brilliance built into it that traces back to Jesus. So step number one is just to appreciate how brilliant this story is itself. Mm -hmm. Now, step number two, this is where last night I was reading this and I paused and I was having dinner and my 11 year old was saying something. I go, son, hang on, just stop. I gotta share this with your mom because I loved the story for so long. I almost felt bad with my 11 year old, but I was so moved by- Were Were you reading this during your family meal? Well, so it wasn't officially a family meal. My wife was doing math, my son, like it was just, we we're just kind of hanging okay, out, yeah. having a late meal, but fair that's question. Fine. I'm and, not uh, judging. Uh, you were judging, but that's okay. We're friends now. Uh, so I'm sitting there and sharing this with my wife. This connection, which is part two, is the connection of this story to the Old Testament. Now, you give six examples of this, and I don't know why, as much as I've read the story, this never went through my mind. We don't have to look at all six of them, but the one that I stopped and was reading to my wife, I was like, look at this. This is incredible, was the connection with Jacob and Esau. And the Mm -hmm. way you get there is to ask the question, Jesus is telling the story about a father with two sons. Well, if we go back to the Old Testament, what are the famous example of a father with two sons? The moment Mm -hmm. you said Isaac, it's like this window opened up for me and I thought, how did I miss this? So tell Mm -hmm. the connection to Jacob and Esau and how that advances your argument. Yes. So um, when Jesus says a man had two sons and I ask people who've been reading the Bible a bit, who's that remind you of? They're going to come back to Mm -hmm. me with one of three answers usually. Uh, Sometimes they'll say Adam because, of course, he had two sons and some more later. Uh, they might say Abraham, because he had two sons, and then some more later. But the, the most uh, accurate answer is Isaac, who had two and only two sons. Now, I would mm. say Jesus triggers all three of those stories uh, with just that opening. A man had two sons. But of course, uh, what's going on in Jesus' story is this older, resentful brother who is resenting the fact that the inheritance, a lot, some of the inheritance has been taken and spent by the younger brother. And of course, the whole story about Isaac uh, and his sons is hinges round inheritance because Jacob tricks his older brother into giving away his birthright, his inheritance. Mm -hmm. He then uh, tricks his father into uh, giving him a blessing. So at each point, he's usurping uh, the older brother older brother is therefore really angry therefore jacob goes off into a far country and feeds animals so you've got something like this but then he comes back and you're expecting esau his older brother to splat him because he was angry and wanted to kill him last time and he's coming towards him with 400 armed men so that doesn't sound very good and you get a whole chapter basically on jacob's defensive measures splitting up his family into different groups so they're not all got at once uh, or some might get away and then the stunning thing is that Esau it says runs embraces and kisses Mm. Jacob and there's only one time that happens in the Bible now scribes have to count phrases Uh, that's how you distinguish one thing from another and so they Mm. knew that phrase really well and so the dramatic high point of Jesus' story is um, also this uh, point which the scribes know, know so well. So I want to read this part because the moment you mentioned to Jacob and Esau, it started unlocking ideas for me. I thought, okay, there's there's a battle between siblings. There's sibling rivalry. They're vying for the father's love and the father's inten- mm-hmm. uh, attention. There's debate about inheritance. There's a story of the goat. There's one son being sent away. In my mind, I'm going, holy cow, there's all of these connections. But in Luke 15, it says... While he was still far off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran, fell on his neck and kissed him. And Mm -hmm. then the wording, you said there's only one other text in the entire Bible in which someone runs, falls on someone's neck and kisses that person. And this is in Genesis 33 with Esau. And it says, but Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. What would you say to somebody who just says, well... This is kind of a coincidence. Sure. Um, so I think you can believe things are coincidence at a certain level. Um, but 
coincidences become less probable through quantitative um, sort of uh, arguments. And so that would work if it were just that case. Uh, but okay. if we bring in lots and lots of cases from the story of Jacob and Esau alone, then it becomes uh, far more probable that Jesus is referring to it. So when we see that um, there is mention of a robe, the father says, bring out the best robe. And Jacob wore specifically Esau's robe to trick his father. When we see that there's mention of a meal with young goats and we realize there's only other one one meal of young goats uh, in, in the Bible. Uh, and that's uh, Esau, sorry, Jacob tricking his father. Uh, when you see the younger son in Jesus' story say, here I am dying of hunger. And you realize that that's exactly what Esau said. I'm dying of hunger when he came in from hunting, starving and gives away his inheritance. Um, all of these cases, you start saying, OK, there's more there. And then it's not just that that's going on with the story of Jacob and Esau. It's the fact that across all of Genesis's greatest hits, you have mm. uh, these sorts of references. And so I think when someone looks at what's chapter two of my book together, I hope they realize that there's a cumulative element to that. So you might, if there were just one case, not be sure whether the author intended this. But when you start getting a whole heap of them, you start thinking, no, th this really is going on. OK, so help us understand how this advances your argument, because I think so far, if people are with us, they're going to say, OK, the story of Luke 15 is a brilliant story. Fine. OK, great connections to the Old Testament. All right. That's neat. <laughs> We haven't gotten to the rest of your argument, but how do these two points advance your argument so far? So Luke presents it as, uh, as a story told to people who don't have much Bible knowledge. They're sort of um, pretty well known for their sin or their interest in collecting money for the Romans. And then he also presents it as, as told to Bible experts like scribes. Now, Jesus' story will work in just about any culture, as far as we know, hmm. it, it goes to deep themes within human existence. Um, family dynamics, older, younger uh, sons, hmm. parental relationships, inheritance, envy, hatred, love, it's all there. Um, and so it works at that level. But it also works if you are a Bible expert. So I think that is a clever thing to be able to do. So none of the references to the Old Testament are clunky or felt like, oh, that's someone's had to work in an awkward way and slightly twist the story in order to get there. Um, then you find that there are actually more stories. So I'd argue the story of Jacob, the story of Laban, the story of Judah and Tamar, the story of Abraham, the uh, story of Cain and Abel are all referenced in this. And it's a three minute story. And actually, we have quite prominent references so I would say when the father says, bring out the ring and the robe, uh, well, there's only one other place you get ring and robe. That's Joseph. And he, of course, is a son who is his father's thinks is dead and then alive again. That's at a time of great famine. There's that phrase, great famine occurs in Jesus' story. So you get all these things together. And what that's doing is how could you have a major Old Testament reference every 20 seconds across this and that's a major one, plus lots of other subtle ones and reversals and so on. So it, it's like every phrase in the story can be mapped onto something from the book of Genesis. How okay. can you tell a story like that so that if you don't know the Bible at all, it's, uh, you know, it's still a powerful story. And if you do, it's got lots of layers of meaning that draw you in and which are not just there to show cleverness. They're actually there to make points. So if Esau is such a bad guy who was tricked out of his entire inheritance and he forgave his younger brother, well, shouldn't the older brother in this story be able to forgive his younger brother? In fact, uh, the older brother's done very well because the younger brother did the dirty work of asking dad for the inheritance up front. As a result, older brothers, um, you know, had an advance on his inheritance. He should be eternally grateful to his younger brother and be willing to do... <laughs> Uh, him any favors for the rest of his life so it's each of these uh, stories actually is is powerful or if it references the story of joseph uh, well joseph was uh, his brothers tried to kill him and then sold him 
So, and he forgave that. So it's a very powerful thing to reference in the story. Okay, so there's a genius that scholars like yourself, 2,000 years later, are still unpacking insights. But there's also a genius that somebody who might not be literate from virtually any culture in the world can relate to this, understand this, remember this, be moved by this. Yep. That's the heart of what you're arguing. Now, step number one, the, the story of the father with two sons is a literary masterpiece taken by itself. Second, mm-hmm. when we go deeper, we find this, this considerable in-depth awareness of the Old Testament that is woven in in both subtle and intentional ways in less than 400 words also takes a layer of genius. Now, Mm -hmm. this stage, as I'm reading, I'm thinking, okay, if this story does trace back to Jesus and we haven't argued that yet, wouldn't we expect to find other stories with numerous (laughs) allusions to the Old Testament? Like this shouldn't be the only one. So do we find other stories? And what might this suggest about the feasibility of crediting this story to Luke alone as the source as opposed to Jesus? Yes, so I think we do uh, find other stories uh, with this. Uh, So Jesus tells 40 or so parables and quite a number of them have Old Testament references. Obviously, this is Jesus's longest story. That just gives more opportunity uh, to find more things. But there's this amazing... Uh, case of his shortest parable arguably which is when he says in Matthew 13 and in Luke 13 uh, that the kingdom of heaven is like a woman who hides yeast or leaven in three sears or measures of flour until it's Mm -hmm. um, all uh, risen and that's a very powerful story because it, it actually references some one of the same verses that the long story references so Uh, I would say that Jesus's story of the prodigal son has this father figure. Who's the archetypal father figure in the Old Mm -hmm. Testament? It's Abraham. And Abraham runs in uh, Mm -hmm. Genesis chapter 18 to welcome some guests, which is very surprising. The very first word out of Abraham's mouth is then the word quick, which he barks to Sarah, then says three seers of flour, and then he goes off and gets the fatted calf. So in Jesus's longest story, he has the father, the old man running. He says the word quick and then he goes and gets the fatted calf or or orders the fatted calf so it's the same sort of thing uh going on but jesus takes the next phrase from genesis 18 verse 6 and he makes that into the shortest um uh, parable which is the kingdom and, and and it's the only time that you get specifically these three particular measures they're called seers s-e-a-h um in in the old testament so um and it says the kingdom of heaven is like that. So Genesis 18 is the story of three visitors coming to Abraham uh, and they, Abraham and Sarah entertain them really well. And Abraham, and Sarah does some baking. Now, at this time, Sarah has no children. Um, and uh, they are promised that they're going to have children as many as the stars and uh, sand you, in that you can't count them. And so from Sarah's baking... Uh, for these guests to angels uh, and and God himself uh, comes this expansion uh, where she comes to have more spiritual and physical children than could possibly be counted so Jesus has that all packed into that story when he talks about the kingdom of heaven now that is a story that comes up in Matthew and in Luke Mm -hmm. so you don't explain how it is in Luke uh unless where well, you could say luke copies matthew or matthew copies luke that, that that that's possible but what you start finding is the pattern of the stories across matthew mark and luke which is where the parables occur they don't occur in john right. um is such that you don't explain anything by crediting the story to one of those gospel writers because you end up having to have multiple gospel writers able to come up with these really cool parables even though in the early church Christians didn't seem to do much with parables. I mean, there's something called the Shepherd of Hermas, uh, Mm -hmm. which is uh, a bit like a parable, but it's really long and really quite different. Um, And Jesus' parables have a particular style. They have a style commonly working Old Testament allusions into them. Uh, Rabbis from the time of Jesus uh, and the land of Jesus didn't normally put the Old Testament reference into the parable itself. They put it at the end. So 
again, it, it's just a, a difference. It looks like a feature of this one particular uh, composer, this one particular artist, let's call him, uh, Jesus Christ. It doesn't make it doesn't explain anything to say, oh, Matthew came up with this, Luke come up, came up with this. It doesn't explain as much. There's still going to be stuff which is just going to be left out of the explanation. Okay, so I want to make sure viewers are tracking here. You're kind of making two points in your book. Number one, that this story is the work of a genius. Mm -hmm. And second, that this story traces back to Jesus. And yep. you do this. So far, we've covered three layers. We're about to go to four. Number one, look at Luke 15 on its surface, literary masterpiece. Number two, there's all these Old Testament allusions brilliantly woven in, which shows that whoever wrote this has powerful, in-depth awareness of the Old Testament mm -hmm. and the ability to weave it into this story in a way that's subtle, but also direct. Third, yep. we start to say, well, this is not the only story that has these kind of allusions, because if it were, maybe we could attribute it to Luke. But we don't find it in John because John doesn't have the parables. But in both Mark and in Matthew, in multiple cases, we find these kinds of allusions back to the Old Testament, which suggests not that Matthew, Mark, and Luke invented this themselves separately, but there is a common source, namely mm -hmm. Jesus, who is the author of this. Now, we haven't connected yeah. all those dots, but am I laying out your case accurately so far? Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Okay, perfect. So let's go to this, uh, the next step. Maybe this is step four, if I'm numbing it correctly. Is you say the author of the story is likely from Palestine. Now, why yep. is this significant? And how does this potentially rule out Luke uh, as the source, the ultimate source? Well, Luke is traditionally thought to come from uh, Antioch in Syria. Um, so, and not to be Jewish. So... If parables are exclusively Jewish, and in fact, they're not just Jews anywhere, uh, they're Jews from Roman Judea, Palestine, Israel, whatever we want to call it. Um, that's where they're coming from. That's already locates the likely origin of these sorts of stories. But there are further features to it, which is if we look at Luke 15 through to 60, we've actually got five of these sorts of stories. So we've got the parable of the lost sheep of the lost coin, mm -hmm. of the two sons of the unjust manager, and then the um, rich man or temporarily rich man and Lazarus. Of course, he's not rich for most of the story, but um, those five stories. And when we look at them, they have all sorts of cross connections between them. So they seem to be coming from the same person. At the same time, when we look at them, we can say that the parable of the uh, unrighteous steward has specific phrases uh, such as um, two of the measures, which are um, a core and a bath, which are particular uh, dry and wet measures um, and liquid mm -hmm. measures, um, and the phrase the sons of righteousness and uh, sorry, unrighteous mammon and the, the children of, of, of light. These are particular phrases that you can trace to the land of Jesus. You can say that the story of the lost sheep uh, is very reminiscent of a parable which seems to be told independently within Judaism, uh, in which Moses goes after a lost sheep. There's a parable of a lost coin, which is reminiscent of a story told within Judaism, where mm -hmm. losing a coin is like losing the law. So, and they're really the warm up act to Jesus's bigger story about the two sons. And they're making some quite pointed. Um, well, points. <laughs> they're, they're, they're quite um, uh, painful points for people to, to realize that they're, they're, they're digging at people who might say they're experts on the law of God, but they actually have lost the sense of it. Moses goes after mm -hmm. the lost. People. That's what Jesus is doing. Um, uh, the people can be actually losing the law. That's a really bad thing. Jesus is keeping the law by going after the lost. So that all works very powerfully together with the third element of the story. And remember, those three stories in Luke 15 are said to be one parable. That's so right. all of that seems to be from a single mind. Now, the, the bit about the, the lost sheep, that's over in Matthew as well. So how can we explain that unless um, it, it, it comes from Jesus? There's a bit more we can say about it because we then start looking at some of the phrases, specific phrases, 
uh, that begin and end parable and some of the features in there where we can trace those same features to Jesus's teachings elsewhere. So it doesn't really explain a lot to say Luke came up with them. What, mm. What's more, if Luke is a Gentile author, brilliant Gentile author, but Gentile author, what is the point in him writing to an audience, putting in lots of Old Testament references they're not even going to notice? Whereas if the story is told to a bunch of scribes, just like Luke says it is, suddenly you can see the sense of it. So the story is most effective if it's actually told to the very audience that Luke reports it's told to. So in this way, I think you can also have a further element of saying um, it's not just that the story has been handed down to us from Jesus. It's also that the context of the telling of the story has been um, handed down. OK, so before somebody concludes, OK, maybe Luke was the genius. After all, Paul tells us he was a physician. The problem mm -hmm. with that is there's an awareness of certain rabbinic background knowledge, which is surprising yep. if he's Gentile. Yep. But also the same features of the parables in the other gospel books, obviously Matthew and Mark as well, which says, wait a minute, Luke can't be the source. Now we have multiple sources with common features rather than the most simple one that this traces back to Jesus himself. Now you, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the question is, how many geniuses do you want to have as well? I mean, <laughs> maybe the earliest Christians were just all, all geniuses, um, <laughs> but it, it's a lot simpler to, to try and not posit too many. So Luke's certainly uh, very smart. But if Luke comes up with this brilliant parable, that won't explain any brilliance going on uh, in bits of Mark or Matthew that aren't paralleled in Luke. So mm. so that that that's where it just does have a much more limited scope uh, as an explanation. Okay, so you list six of these features that suggest the parables all trace mm -hmm. back to a common source. We don't have to look at all six, but let's look at maybe three of them just to kind yep. of give viewers a sense of what, what you mean here. And one of them is that questions uh, yep. begin parables. Yeah, so, so I mean, it's a feature of a lot of what Jesus says uh, in, I'm just getting my book out to, you know, refresh my memory. I don't have absolutely everything in, in my head, but it's a feature of a lot of um, Jesus's uh, or si things attributed to Jesus across the Gospels that he uses an awful lot of questions. He even uses counter questions and so on. And what we find is that Matthew and Luke independently report Jesus as beginning stories with questions, even when they're telling different stories. So um, in uh Luke Luke 15 he would uh, begin a story and uh, well actually we've got a whole number of cases in Luke seven of them at least where he says which of you will have a friend which father of you which of you by worrying can add and so on lots of these which of you uh, sorts of uh, questions that he has now you can't explain those by uh, saying that they just come from Luke and not from Matthew because we can find similar ones over in Matthew but with different sayings uh, so that's one element. And so you actually have two stories of, of, of two sons. That, that, so the saying a man had two sons comes up in Luke 15 and it comes up in Matthew 21. Mm -hmm. And they're actually two different stories, but with a quite a similar structure. So one of them is this longer three minute story about the runaway son. The other one is about a father going to two sons, asking them to go and work in the vineyard. Uh, the uh, first one says no and then does it and the second one says yes and then doesn't and the thing about that is then that the conclusion is um, that uh, tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of, ahead of you that is people who look like they're saying no actually end up saying yes and, and uh, you know in religious terms it, it's obviously often there's a reversal of what you'd expect so it's a very similar point going on but it's a massively shorter story uh, it's got nothing except for its logical structure in in common it doesn't have have common mm. wording other after that man had two sons but it's got some of the same features so uh, jesus will begin with that question what does it seem to you um which is quite similar to the way the first two stories in luke 15 begin which of you um uh is is the way 
Luke 15 will begin. So it's it's a similar sort of um, thing going on. Then there's a further element which you might, uh, which I can might, might as well slip in here. Since we're on this story, how you address a father. Yep. So Luke 15 is very conscious about how you address a father because the prodigal son addresses his father as father. The um, son who's supposedly hardworking back at home forgets that and just says, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. Well, over in Matthew 21, in this story that is not paralleled in Luke and is completely different, um, you have the same sort of thing where you've got the son who says no, who, who um, then goes later and he's quite brusque with his father and doesn't say anything whereas the son who says yes mm -hmm. but then doesn't go he says sir and so you see this um storyteller technique about how even the address becomes an important thing now you can't explain luke by saying it comes from matthew or matthew by um say it comes from luke because there's such different stories and the person mm. who's polite is actually the opposite person in each story um so but you can see the same mindset behind it, the, the way that you use a term of address in telling a story to um, give, give you emotional closeness or distance. So Luke obviously begins his account by saying many have t undertaken to write an account who were eyewitnesses. Yep. So Luke used sources. Uh, most argue that it was Mark, uh, maybe Q, these sources that are written down. But he also includes a lot of details and stories, hence Luke 15, not in any of the other synoptics, yeah. and tells stories in a different way at times, but with this underlying common thread that you lay out in these six principles that make us pause and go, okay, wait a minute. Why are these features so similar in terms of how Jesus tells these parables? In maybe obvious ways, like how you begin a parable is not that hard, but even how to address the father in a particular way, they match up and suggest a common source outside of the gospel writers. I think yeah. that's brilliant. Now, so far you're arguing that there's a brilliance within the teachings of Jesus itself tied to the Old Testament. It suggests this common source that is not Matthew, Mark, or Luke. But of course, the next question is going to be, well, how do we know that common source is Jesus? Mm -hmm. It could have yep. been some other genius. Make that connection for us. Yeah, sure. And, and so, of, of course, you've got to remember there's an infinite number of explanations for everything, an actual infinite. You can always posit aliens. Um, there's, not an <laughs> you know, there's not an infinite number okay. of simple explanations. So let's, let's allow that anyone can explain any of my data by positing aliens, right? That's fine. Uh, it's just not a simple thing to do. So I'm saying there's this beautifully simple thing. What if these really brilliant sayings actually go back to the most famous Jewish teacher that there ever was? Mm. One who started a movement with like two and a half billion people saying that they, they follow him nowadays. You know, that's, it's, it's not a very expensive hypothesis. It actually hits on everything. It gets us someone from the right land, knowledge of rabbinic stuff it explains the context it explains what arises so i don't want to sort of get into the area of a proof prove to me something comes from something of course i can't prove that anything comes from anyone uh that that's not the way we um that's not the way we live our lives you know prove to me that food on the supermarket shelf isn't poisoned before i eat it i mean that's like stupid dumb um not it's not the way we live we we live humans are social creatures we have to recognize that, that the social nature of knowledge is is really key it's going to become more key in the next few years as video fakes become so much more powerful mm. uh and so that that we are social creatures who need to depend on other humans now using the normal rational way that we consider truth you can see that we have a very simple explanation um, for how the story got uh, to uh, Luke's gospel, that it actually comes from Jesus. And over against that, we've got lots of hand waving uh, about what might have happened. And we can mm. invent some other genius who comes up with a great story for no reason and doesn't want any credit for it and so on. And it's just a question of uh, 
well, which is more believable? Hmm. I appreciate the way you frame this, that it's not proof. This is not a knock down, drag out argument, but it simply mm -hmm. starts with the, the, with the idea that the gospel writers claim to be reporting truth. Either they're eyewitnesses or they are reporting what eyewitnesses said. And they tell mm -hmm. these stories of Jesus and consistently trace them back to Jesus being the source itself. And then you've laid out your case that this fits and makes sense. And then simply said, if this is the most simple explanation, why not adopt it? I think that's a very fair, balanced conclusion mm -hmm. from the argument that you've made. Now, one piece of this, and this might go somewhat beyond the scope of your book, is people say, okay, maybe these stories trace back to Jesus, but how do we know we can trust the time in which they were passed on to when they were written down, whether Luke wrote in the 60s or the 80s, you still have a lot of decades in between that time. How do we know they weren't changed and adapted and really reliable since we have the physical documents written later? Yeah, so I think um, that way of reasoning does, it is a bit unusual. I mean, it's, it's, it's very common on the internet when people are talking about Christianity, sure. but it's not the way people usually live their lives. So you go up into the attic and you find mm. an old family photo and your question isn't, how did this survive? Uh, you'll think, oh, it survived. Um, so what I would want to say is, you know, you, you can, you can uh, the example I give in the book is you can bump into a friend in a city where you're not expecting to see them and you're absolutely sure it's them. And that is does not depend on the question, how did you get here? That's an absolutely mm. secondary question. Uh, so I have no idea uh, you know, how you got into your studio today, but I can see you're there. Uh, and, and you can see this you know, uh, face, face to face with people uh, even more powerfully. So what we can say is committees don't come up with brilliant poems. Committees don't come up with brilliant stories. So if you want to tell me that, say, Jesus tells a bit of the story, then someone else adds snowball, snowball, and it suddenly becomes a story which is better than any three minute story you can tell me of any great writer on the planet. So, wow, I mean, give me any case in history where a committee is able to come up with such a good story. Uh, I mean, we ha I mean, go, go into a bookshop and look at all the novels there are mm. and tell me how many of them are written by committees. Yes, I know ch committees do some children's books. I understand that. But but really, it, it just doesn't happen. All the great writers, they're, uh, they're single storytellers. Yes committees can make film scripts i understand that but but really it, it 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 it's not as good or simple an explanation and i'd want to say that there are lots of ways that the information can get to luke so for instance it's such a good story um jesus could have taught his disciples to learn it by heart i'm you know say right okay repeat after me just learn it that's not problematic people can learn an awful lot most of us know ten thousand lines of film script we may not even know that, but we do. Or poetry, and you know, whether it's it's hymns or lyrics and these sort of things. We we we, we yeah, not just film script, but when you take all the lyrics that we could do sure. by heart, we, we know an awful lot. So there's no um, problem uh, with that sort of memorization. We talk about three minutes. Um, yes, it could be written down on wax tablets because people did. Uh, Jesus goes around teaching in different places. He can use the story more than once. That's another way. Hmm. There are lots of different ways that it can get to Luke. I absolutely don't know. I, I don't even, th I mean, I'm really interested in the story, uh, in the question of how the information gets over, but uh, nothing huge depends on it. I think you can recognize this is the hallmarks of what is attributed to the same teacher in another book. Therefore, it seems to come from the same teacher. Uh, people can, when, when people look at things by Plato and they say this comes from Plato, um, we're talking about manuscripts massively later than Plato, a really long period of transmission. Lots can change, but say, aha, we've got this feature of the way Plato uh, writes in this dialogue. That's similar to the way it's written in this other dialogue. So probably they go back to the same author. It's, it's just a simple way of reasoning. But this prove to me something hasn't changed, prove a negative um, is a rather strange hmm. way of looking at things seems a lot of your case is just saying what's common sense what's straightforward what's the simplest explanation that's really your methodology isn't it 
Uh, yes. So, I mean, common sense is a loaded term because it can be all the prejudices that we got by the time of 18. But what I would say is when Jesus reasons with people, he asks them to be consistent. So often in his counter questions, he'll say, why do you do this? So what I would want to do is I'd want to look at the people. People are already the way people are already reasoning. And I would suggest that people in other areas of their life tend to reason one way and then they sometimes change the way they reason when they come to questions about Christianity and Jesus. And so I'd say, no, no, just be more consistent. This isn't the sort of way that you go about evaluating truth hypotheses in other areas of your life. So why are you applying it this partic in this particular case? Because I think it reveals something uh, that often uh, humans are not looking for the truth. Uh, and they're not, uh, and and hopefully by just encouraging people to be consistent, um, that will help people to see what's really going on in their hearts. So Peter, of course, there's more depth in your book. You look at stories like Luke chapter 16, which is the very mm -hmm. chapter after uh, Luke 15, yep. which is the story of the father with two sons, and you make some important connections there in that story of Lazarus. Uh, there's a lot more in your book, but as far as laying out the basics of the arguments, that Jesus is a genius, did we miss anything? No, no, I'm really, uh, you've covered it well. Okay, so few last questions. I want to know, and this goes beyond the scope of your book. In some ways, it's an apologetics book, you're arguing. Mm -hmm. It's also a book just to appreciate who Jesus is and arguably have mm -hmm. a more accurate view of who he is. Yep. But I'm curious what your message would be for skeptics who are watching this, someone who's not a believer. And that could be somebody who's a Muslim, could be an agnostic, just yeah. somebody who's not convinced of Christianity and Jesus. So, I mean, I would just encourage anyone to read the Gospels and uh, to mm. look at the person of Jesus, ask themselves the question, could this really be made up? Um, and ask yourself what you think of this person, because I, I, I think that... Um, Jesus, as portrayed in the Gospels, is amazing, uh, unique, um, un unlike anyone uh, that we come across, and yet so very real. Uh, and I find it very hard to imagine how the Jesus of the Gospels could be made up. I also think that um, the hypothesis that this is really good reporting actually will explain far more of what we see in the text. So I just say, Read the, the nine hours of text we have in the gospel, see the person of Jesus. And um, yes, I think that's the very best thing to do. So the takeaway for believers, uh, I'm curious, because as I was reading this, I thought a lot of uh, the writings of Dallas Willard, and you quote him, mm -hmm. so you're aware of this. Yeah, yeah, one of amazing. My, one of my colleagues at Biola, who's been a mentor of mine, J.P. Moreland, was a student mm -hmm. of Dallas Willard and just mm -hmm. deeply shaped by Dallas's argument that Jesus was smart. And I remember mm -hmm. the first time I heard that, I think I was probably in college. I took an apologetics class with JP. And I remember thinking, Jesus is smart. Like I hadn't put that category in this category. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, the takeaway is I trust my doctor because I think my doctor is smart and mm -hmm. can really identify maybe what's wrong if I'm sick. I trust my mechanic because yeah. he's smart. Well, we're not gonna trust Jesus if we don't think he's smart. But your argument mm -hmm. is not only that he's not just smart, he's a genius. Mm -hmm. So for believers, what's just the practical or spiritual takeaway of viewing Jesus this way? Well, I, I think, wouldn't you want the smartest guide for your life? So mm -hmm. uh, you could be looking for wisdom in all sorts of other areas and the latest new, new newfangled book and fad. Um, and realize that Jesus is the, the fount of all wisdom. I think the other thing is to expect to see more in his teaching. So I, I think, that, or, and expect to see more in the Bible. Uh, people often, when they've been in church for a, a while, a plateau in the knowledge of the Bible, not, not interested in going uh, deeper, it's hard work. You can get the sort of broad gist of things uh, quite quickly. And then where do you go from there? And well, you've got enough not to be embarrassed in church. so. Maybe you should just stop there. But to recognize that there is a depth of wisdom, uh, which is really incredible, 
should encourage people to go further. But I'd want to add one more audience in here, and this is really for academics and those more academically inclined, which is I think Jesus is smarter than any of us, and he also mm. speaks in a very, very simple way. And what a lot of ac academic work can be doing, and Jesus actually nails it when he talks to the Pharisees, he say, you take away the key of knowledge. So, in other words, a lot of what is going on is people locking up truth by hiding it behind complicated phrases and that sort of thing. They're actually obscuring truth. And so Jesus, with his simplicity, calls that out because the, the simpler someone uh, is communicating, the, the less room there is to hide. When people are using really high sounding phrases and so on, there's a lot of room to hide. Uh, all sorts of bad stuff, bad motives, and, and so on. So I, I would say that, for me, has been an amazing example of Jesus. I'd say it's something that Dallas Willard certainly uh, took to heart. He he was, as a teacher, someone who allowed you to underestimate him. Uh, and I remember when I first met him, I did underestimate him, and then soon came to realise, oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and I think um, that's actually a, a model for us. So the book is... 35,000 words, and again, more than Carpenter's 35,000 words. That's mm -hmm. like an introductory book. A lot of people say, mm -hmm. I want more depth, I want more arguments, and of course, that's what evidence that demands verdict is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. When I'm reading your book, I'm thinking, this is just the beginning of a whole new way of thinking about Jesus. I mm -hmm. would love to see, I I'm not asking you to do more work, but either you or one of your students or somebody else, take this approach to more of the teachings and parables of Jesus, unpack it further and do kind of the evidence that demands a verdict version that follows, kind of like Bauckham's book, Jesus mm -hmm. and the Eyewitnesses. He goes yep. into incredible depth and really unlocks a way of seeing how the gospels can be taken as eyewitnesses. Do you think there's a lot more research and study that you've just kind of opened up the door to, whether you do it or further students do it, kind of in this lane yeah i mean i, I certainly uh, um, have been seeing things in the parable since i finished the book uh and i think uh there are many different <laughs> layers to things uh so my hope certainly would be that it's going to inspire and mm. provoke others to do things i'm not going to do the work so i'm moving on <laughs> uh and uh <laughs> no i am i'm going back to old testament so Good. uh yeah um but yes there's, there's an awful lot to uh see there part of it is expecting more and having a research agenda so that we can actually uh look for things mm -hmm. yeah well i would definitely say aspiring phd students and not just them get a copy of the surprising genius of jesus because i think there's a lot of avenues of further research where they could take kind of this model that you've laid out and start applying it to new uh new passages and new parables mm -hmm and just unlock the genius of Jesus in a way that's been lost. But the genius of your book is it's not just for PhDs. I think somebody can pick it up and read it and be challenged in the way that we've walked through. So thoroughly enjoy the book. I, I think my viewers are gonna really enjoy it. it. I share a lot of stuff with my kids and my wife when I read stuff, but I paused last night, yes, during an informal dinner and had to share with my wife because it struck me and some of that is because I think the book is brilliant, but I absolutely love the story in Luke 15. So people watching this, if you've been moved by that story, which I would argue is one of the greatest stories that Jesus told, and you want to understand it in more depth, pick up The Return of Prodigal Son by Henry Nowen, pick up, I think it's called The Prodigal God by Timothy Keller, and pick up The Surprising Genius of Jesus by our guest, Peter Williams. And before you turn away, make sure you hit subscribe. We've got some other shows coming up on apologetics, worldview, culture related, you won't want to miss. And also, if you thought about studying apologetics, we would love to have you at Biola. We have students from all around the world, as you know, Peter. Uh, we have a fully distanced program. Uh, there's info below. If you're like, I'm not sure I'm ready for a master's program, we have a certificate program. We'd love to guide you through just how to become a better apologist. Peter, we're going to have to have you back. I can't believe this is the first one, but keep me posted on what you're doing in the Old Testament, and uh, let's do it again. Thank you very much.